member of the Catholic Society's many years in Dr. Bert Davis. He received his chemistry PhD degree at the University of Florida. He did some postdoc work under Paul Emmett. Uh, he spent four <coughs> years in mobile oil, seven years at, uh, as a teacher at West Virginia University, and 21 years now at the Center of Advanced Energy Research. I mean, Bert Davis is our, uh, started out as our, I guess, code to, uh, which he's going to talk about today, so I won't get into all that. But uh, Bert was also a club representative. He was a secretary of the North American Cattle Society. And Bert is uh, really one of the, the uh, I'd say, signature people in the field of catalysis. So let's welcome Bert Davis. Well, like the last speaker, Carl gives an introduction that's tough to live up to. I always forget so that uh, this, what I'm going to talk about was funded by DOE and the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Uh, Fred asked uh, to give an overview of gas to liquids. Actually, once you get it to send gas, it's just a matter of what is the hydrogen to CO ratio. And so uh, if you just change the ratio, this will be for uh, coal to liquids also, so that we can honor the coal industry in Kentucky and hopefully keep getting state funding on the first page. Uh, Fisher Tropes is the first uh, equation where you are converting carbon monoxide hydrogen to hydrocarbon plus water. If you use a iron catalyst, uh, you have a competing reaction water gas shift in which water plus CO is producing hydrogen and CO2. The second one is important when the syn gas is derived from uh, coal. It is not important if you can get the hydrogen to CO ratio of two or slightly higher from natural gas, so that this can be looked at as an advantage for coal, a disadvantage if you're using iron for natural gas. Why is there interest now in Fisher Tropes? Uh, it, one of the products is diesel and to maximize diesel production. Why are they interested in diesel? This is the only transportation fuel in the U.S. whose uh, usage is increasing over the last 15 years. Gasoline consumption is roughly constant. Diesel fuel with trucks and heavier vehicles is increasing. The reason you want diesel to these other possible competitors uh, is the relative fuel volume for distance traveled. And so diesel is much better than any of the substitutes that we might have for transportation. A second reason and you will see eco-diesel and other uh, nice words associated with it. And one reason <coughs> for this is that the greenhouse gas equivalent of CO, methane, NOx, etc., <coughs> is lower with diesel than the potential substitutes. So the combination of long distance traveled per volume and the environmental friendly nature makes it of interest. <coughs> to show that there has been some progress in Fisher Tropes uh, catalysis, uh, what I'm doing here is taking uh, similar conditions. All of these are in the slurry phase. Fisher Tropes are very exothermic. The interest now is doing it in the liquid phase in a slurry where you disperse the catalyst in a liquid and pass the gas through in a three-phase reactor. This was work done at the Bureau of Mines about 1950, taking that as one. There has been a gradual increase over 50 years, so that now 
we have an activity that's roughly 50 times that of the Bureau of Mines. So that, uh, there's been gradual improvement in the activity for iron-based catalyst. One of the reasons that natural gas, well, it would help if you could read it, is attractive is that only about 50% of the production cost comes from gasification if you base it on natural gas. Base it on coal, this is about two thirds. Uh, this is a recent estimate of the cost associated with a 100,000 barrel per day plant. Now, one of the problems with Fisher tropes is illustrated in this bottom figure. It is a polymerization in which C1 is the monomer. And so the only product you can make with high selectivity is methane. But if you're starting with natural gas, you aren't interested in making methane. And so any other product any other alpha which is related to the termination propagation probability for polymerization gives you a distribution of products. Simple one is just a linear relationship. The higher the number of alpha, the heavier the product and more wax. This is an advantage in the wax can then be hydrocracked to make a significant yield of diesel. Product distribution that you get related to alpha, the probability of propagation of the chain to termination. If it's low, if it's zero, you get just methane. As you go to higher alpha, you get less and less methane, more and more heavy products. I, people are now talking about working at 0.9 or higher alpha values. And so you will get a large amount of heavy wax which then has to be selectively converted to uh, diesel or other transportation fuels. One place in where it started being used commercially was in South Africa. This gives you an indication of the scale. This was the Kellogg pilot plant in the US, which is the basis for the circulating fluid bed uh, fissure trope synthesis. They have a catalyst. This is very similar to fluid catalytic cracking, if you're familiar with that, and was a direct outgrowth of fluid catalytic cracking. The catalyst is circulated from the reactor through cooling and back to the reactor. You, you circulate tons and tons of catalysts per minute. Uh, it was a major engineering accomplishment to put this on stream. Since you're operating fluid bed, you can't have liquid product, and so this emphasizes gasoline rather than diesel. This is the size growth of unit at SAS all over the years, but engineers eventually come to the point where you say, why have we been doing it this way for all these years? And so they made a 50% reduction in size in going from circulating fluid bed to fixed fluid bed. And so now the cost of building this is about 50% of the stuff they have been using since the 1950s. Uh, and so if you get it to the commercial stage, then economics and hiring the right person will force you to make advances. And they made gradual advances as the size showed but then a significant advance in decreasing by 50% the cost. The reaction is very exothermic. That's why it was done in circulating fluid bed where temperature could be controlled. They also started out at the same time using tubular fixed bed. This way they could make the heavy product. It would just drip out the bottom of the reactor. They were able to increase so that they got to 12,000 barrel per day. And then they went to the slurry phase, much better heat control. And now they make 2,500 barrels per day in the slurry phase reactor. They are designing to scale to 10,000 barrels or higher 
per reactor in the slurry scale. And so again, the gradual improvement, and then they change significantly to a new technology. Again, the driving force of getting tired of trying to pack, so you get same pressure drop through 3,000, 10,000 tubes filled with catalyst. If you don't get the same pressure drop, then it all goes through one tube, you get a hot spot and no product. Shell has uh, also come on stage recently with a commercial plant. This one is based on natural gas. The Sasol is based on uh, coal. They gasify, then pass through fixed bed reactor. So Shell made a deliberate decision to go with the most proven technology, even though it took them somewhere between a year and two years to pack all of the catalyst in the tubes. Uh, measuring each tube to make sure pressure drop is the same, probably cussing and throwing away a few along the way. But they ran, uh, it was run successfully, they got to the design capacity, and then they say somehow leaves coming from the fire in Malaysia got in the oxygen plant. For whatever reason, the oxygen plant blew up. And so they will now start back up in 2001. However, they have shipped diesel to California. So. Um, this is a product distribution from uh, different plants. Uh, if the simple polymerization, this should continue on with a straight line. It isn't a simple polymerization, and people have argued about this for years. I put this in only to show that there's one of the, uh, three of these plants were done in Germany during or following the Second World War, but one was in the United States that uh, is listed standard oil. This was uh, developed in Texas by HRI. The bottom figure shows the Fisher Tropes product as it's produced at Shell, leaving out gaseous products. This is the liquid product that they collect coming out of the reactor. A lot of the work is then to convert this small amount of product into transportation fuel. Gasoline up to about C11 and then diesel and jet fuel. And so this compares their medium hydrocrack product and their have, uh, high severity hydrocracking. And so once you get the Fisher Tropes heavy wax, you have to convert this fraction of the product into transportation fuel. The slurry reactor is the standard that everyone now wants to use, except Shell. I, up until DOE funded work at Mobile, this was the only data available. This was generated in Germany in the 1950s by Cobell and co-workers. He obtained what you really want if you're trying to make gasoline, very low methane and very low wax. Mobile Oil, while they were working on DOE contract, put together product distribution showing methane and reactor wax yield. Their data, other data, our data would fit on this slide. And so, the standard for slurry reactors up until this mobile work was Cobell, which while pointed out the advantage of the slurry reactor, was in many people's view overly optimistic as far as how good it was for making transportation fuel. That you would expect if he got this small amount of wax that methane would be up here 9 or 10 percent rather than 3.
the case with cobalt catalyst, the, this is work from Exxon and all cobalt catalysts, according to them, whatever support you put it on, is equally active. The only thing that determines activity for all of the cobalt catalysts on this graph is how well can you make the dispersion of cobalt and how well can you keep it dispersed. And so if you're making a cobalt catalyst, you just want to strive for higher dispersion. Now there are two examples here which don't fit this. One especially is where they have cobalt on titania, which is promoted with ruthenium. This one shows much higher space-time yield than you would expect from the catalyst dispersion. Now, I say this was reported by Exxon. It may not surprise you that these two points which fall off of this and show much better activity than you would expect are Exxon catalysts. And so uh, they are saying that they have been able to change this. One of the big things that also has been advanced by Exxon is that the paraffin termination is the same. So you get a single straight line. The reason you get the two alpha plot, two straight lines, is they contend the significant amount of the products is formed by secondary reaction where the alpha olefin is what uh, in reincorporated and starts a chain growing at high carbon number and so it makes the second alpha of that two alpha plot. Uh, it remains to be proven whether that is or is not the case. If you were a catalyst company and trying to decide uh, which support to use based on the literature, uh, this is one which would say that you should use aluminum. I, I see I didn't get the plot in here. I could also show you a plot from Air Products which would show silica support being the best and aluminum being down here and titania here. I could also show you one by Bartholomew which would say titania support is up here and the others are down here. So that there is an enormous amount of literature for uh, cobalt catalyst and for fischer trope synthesis, but it is very difficult to know which is the correct literature that you should follow. And so if we could find some uh, combinatorial process to sort this data out, I guess what I'm saying is there's an enormous database, but we don't have a computer program to give credibility to it at this point. For catalyst manufacturers, there is potential. Uh, uh, what this tries to show is if you are to the point of, think of this, this solid line reps, represents diffusion limitation. You've made the catalyst active enough that if you're on this line and you get it any more active, you've now transferred from kinetic control to diffusion control. If you look at methanation catalysts, you see that uh, UCI and these other companies making methanation catalysts have done very well. Uh, they're on the line, but if you get fischer tropes catalyst, you're over here where there's still much room for improvement to make more active catalysts. Now iron has uh, an advantage in that it's very stable activity. Uh, this shows uh, running for about five months, the decline in activity is less than 1% per week. And so this catalyst, uh, you can make it so that it's very active and very uh, stable. 
the activity, however, depends on the level of conversion. It starts out, the conversion is increasing rapidly with time, and then it levels off. Also, you have a change in selectivity. At low conversion levels, hydrogen reacts more rapidly than CO. As you go to the equivalence point here and, and then go beyond, now CO is reacting more rapidly than hydrogen because you're producing more hydrogen than you're using. So that to make effective use of selectivity, and activity of an iron catalyst you want to operate at lower con <coughs> conversion levels. <coughs> this is shown with the, uh, for example, the product of uh, the water gas shift reaction CO2 goes through a maximum. If we look at the same curve for hydrocarbons, it goes through a maximum, but at a lower conversion level. And so we can optimize this. Uh, th this is for grams of hydrocarbon. It peaks at a lower space velocity than does CO2. And so it offers engineering possibilities. It also offers the ability to uh, convert more of the CO to hydrocarbons by operating at lower conversion levels. If you operate at lower conversion levels, you're getting more grams of the CO converted to hydrocarbon. As you go to higher conversion levels, then you reach a lower productivity of hydrocarbons. And you want to make hydrocarbons rather than CO2. So that it offers a processing uh, option in which um, you want to operate at low conversion in series uh, if you are going to take advantage of these uh, uh, better qualities of the iron catalyst. Now, if I'm going to cover what is in the title, I, I need to skip a few slides or Carl will drag me off here. And uh, commercially, uh, there have been commercial plants before. Uh, Brownville, Texas, uh, they found the Arabian oil and that stopped the development of this in the 1950s. But South Africa has shown continuous increase and they're now over 100,000 barrels per day production. Moss gas uses SASO technology, over 30,000. So South Africa produces approximately 40% of their transportation fuel from Fisher Trump synthesis, or at least they have the capability. Uh, they're diverting some of this now to chemicals. During the war, Japan had several plants. The total was approximately that. Uh, Germany and uh, this, uh, I guess, is the maximum they would have ever produced. Uh, Malaysia Shell now has a commercial plant. All of these were essentially, uh, except for Germany during the war, were iron-based catalysts. Cobalt is just here, and both of these were in fixed bed. Pilot plants that have been operated, uh, large ones, uh, this is the work by uh, Cobell. Uh, he is saying that in his case, the reason for low methane, he recycled the oil, and about 80% of what he recycled made transportation fuel. British Fuel built a large pilot plant. They were never able to successfully operate it. Bureau of Mines uh, operated both ebulated bed with large catalyst particles, slurry phase, uh, again, finding oil in the Middle East, stopped work on this. Exxon has announced and have carried this through 
a uh, 1.2 meter diameter, and this is around 40 foot tall uh, pilot plant, and developed an integrated process strictly for natural gas. People who are using small pilot plants, and again, this is uh, mostly U.S. Uh, I did put China in since they gave me a book on Fisher Tropes. <coughs> Unfortunately, it's in Chinese, but at least I put it up here to acknowledge that it's a book. Uh, Centrolium is a small company based in Tulsa, which has uh, technical data that some suspect, but without question, they have been the leading company in getting interest in Fisher Tropes again. Uh, Gulf Oil, now Chevron, developed pilot plant, fixed bed cobalt catalyst, which is a predecessor or developed in parallel with what, Gulf, uh, what uh, Shell developed. Rentec has operated a 280 uh, barrel per day what they call a commercial plant uh, in the U.S., but they were basing it on a, a landfill outside of Denver for their methane source, and it turned out to be much smaller than they thought it was, and they have now sold the plant and shipped it to India. China had, and Mobile both operated smaller <coughs> Uh, two phase or two stage where the first one is Fisher Tropes, the second one is ZSM5 type conversion to gasoline. Uh, this is going out of favor in the US at least because the gasoline is highly aromatic and people are no longer interested in that. And now a small pilot plant operated in the port, uh, Texas, you know, which uh, UCI has contributed at least for the iron by making the Fisher Tropes catalyst. If you want to run a pilot plant today, you have great problems in that there aren't available commercial catalysts. And so you have to find someone willing to help you in making some at a scale for the pilot plant. <coughs> Now these are some potential uh, commercial operations. Some of them have a long way to go, some of them less distance. Uh, carbon resources is one that <clears throat> is using plasma to generate the syngas. And so their major contribution is in syngas generation, greatly decreasing the cost of syngas, which currently is about 50% of the total cost. Their Fisher Tropes technology is using cobalt at low pressure, essentially, or at least what is in the public is similar to what was used by the Germans during the Second World War. Conoco DuPont has some activity because there is a person who was handing out business cards saying, uh, manager Fisher Tropes technology. And so at least if you get to the point of a business card, you're doing something, I guess. Exxon has announced publicly that they have a process. It's been through uh, roughly 200 barrel per day pilot plant, they say. And they have done this with FCC, uh, where they've scaled from that size pilot plant to a commercial plant. And they have two, at least, that they're considering. One is in Gutter, or when I was back in West Virginia, Qatar, uh, 150 to 100,000 barrel per day plant. And they're considering a like size for natural gas in Alaska. How Baker Engineering announced that they are going to develop a Fisher Tropes process. Rima likewise and has signed a contract in uh, uh, a nice island off of Venezuela. I'll let you look it up in this homework. Trinidad, that's what I was. Uh, Rentec, I say, sold their plant. It's now in uh, uh, India. 
they just announced an agreement with Texaco not only to base fisher probes on natural gas or coal, but also on petroleum coal. And so this is of interest to Texaco, is to find something to do with petroleum coal. Uh, Sasol has announced a plant for uh, gutter with Phillips Petroleum, Phillips Petroleum providing the hydrocracking technology, Sasol doing the uh, fissure troughs. They've also announced one for Nigeria in which Chevron is going to provide hydrocracking and the natural gas Sasol would provide the technology. Shell has a commercial plant in Malaysia that has operated, they say, according to their expectations until the oxygen plant blew up. And they say it will operate at one and a half to two times what it was designed for, incorporating improvements that they have made in research. Uh, this is a small company Norm Carr is associated with, uh, Syncrude. Uh, and the Williams Company with Energy International in the lead also has announced that they have a gas cap process. And their uh, figure I did show of cobalt catalyst activity was their catalyst, which produces roughly one gram per gram of catalyst per hour. Uh, with that, uh, my time is up, and so I will stop and keep Carl happy with the schedule. <laughs> Any questions of Bert? Yeah, this is probably a really stupid question. I mean, you already answered it, but I'm kind of curious, since it's so easy to take sim gas and make methanol, what are the relative economics for uh, fisher trolls versus the methanol and gas route? Um, well, I guess I, I could give you two answers. The first is that uh, during the energy crisis, uh, this was exactly what New Zealand decided to do. Uh, they built the world's largest methanol plant and then converted using mobile ZSM-5 technology to make gasoline. <clears throat> the gasoline at that time was, the, the price of gasoline is considered uh, three times the price of methanol plus five cents. Mm -hmm. That the conversion of methanol to gasoline was very cheap compared to making. Mm -hmm. um, they have now essentially closed the gasoline part of the plant. Even uh, The second thing is that it, it makes highly aromatic gasoline. Okay. We, we, we currently are flat with gasoline. What is needed in the U.S and more and more in Europe, is the increasing fuel, which is diesel. You can't make diesel from methanol unless you do what Amoco was pushing when Amoco existed as Amoco. Uh, they're now, with uh, other companies, become the second largest uh, petroleum company. And so they were going to make dimethyl ether. This very good diesel properties, <clears throat> except it won't fit in the diesel tank because it's a gas at room temperature. <laughs> and so, uh, people keep trying to use methanol. And if you use it directly, you have the volume problem. Uh, and it's not available. So that's why diesel is still competitive. It's it fits into existing market, it's where it's increasing, it's where they have to improve the quality of diesel, and the Fisher Tropes has a CK number of about seven. So that's a long answer to the short question. Any other questions? Ready to go. I was just gonna answer the question. I keep hearing all these stories about like pumping methane back into the oil wells and that there should be a strong driving force to do these kinds of things because of this excess methane and not knowing what to do with it. What is happening with that? Why doesn't it seem to... That is my understanding. There, there are two things. One is the pumping of methane back. It's getting more and more costly as you go deeper and deeper for crude. 
uh, more pressure is needed to put it back. The second thing is that countries are now saying if you pump it out of the ground, you got to pass the, the royalty on it, even if you put it back in the ground. And so one of the driving forces for the uh, Sasso Chevron is they're being forced to use the natural gas that's associated with crude. And so it's not just putting it back in the ground, it's you're going to have to pay for it, whatever you do with it. So at least try to break even without having to spend money to put it back in the ground and not recover anything. So in those isolated instances, all you have to do with fisher tropes is break even or at least beat the negative cost of pumping it back in the ground, and then it makes sense. Carl, I I think that the importance of fisher drops in future will be if we succeeded to make the catalyst much more selective. And uh, what, what do you think about this? How, how we can improve the selectivity? That is a one question. Another question, quite another that we had in Germany two, during the World War and shortly after that, uh, two technologies, Fischer-Tropsch and uh, various uh, coal hydrogenation. Yes. What do you think could in the future compete this uh, coal hydrogenation with Fischer-Tropsch? Because it's a direct way. You need not to gasify uh, coal and to make CO, you, you are going directly from the from the source to hydrocarbons? Well, 15 years ago, I was working on direct liquefaction, so then I would have had to say that's absolutely the way to go. Uh, but <laughs> now I'm working on fisher crop, so that's how it I will give you the DOE answer, Department of Energy. Uh, they have said that for the next 20 years in the U.S., direct hydrogenation of coal is dead. They're not going to put any more money on it. And so companies have given up on it. Uh, it's always more costly. And the price of coal seems to follow the price. Of, if, if gasoline goes up, then coal goes up. So uh, the advantage, the, the thing pushing Fisher tropes now is the diesel. Um, Shapes uh, the, the cutoff. Centroleum made, in quotes, their reputation by saying they had a chain limiting catalyst. Now, their chain limiting catalyst gave the same product distribution that Sasol gives. They have to have a chain limiting catalyst to keep a flow of that. I have a folder with at least 15 papers who said they have deviated from Anderson Schultz floor. If you go back and look at them, they deviated by taking a sample at a very short time on stream when the liquid product is still held up in the catalyst. And so, yes, you don't get it. It's, it hasn't come to a steady state. Or that they do online GC analysis and the temperature transfer line determines what gets to the GC. I, I cannot find anyone who's been able to deviate so that you limit the chain. Now the two alpha deviates in the direction you want if you're trying to make heavy wax. But the only ones I've ever seen deviate that hold up the word steady state are those which deviate to heavier products. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.